Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, yesterday's royal wedding in Windsor is estimated to have provided a £120 million boost to the British economy. That may be welcome, but down the road in London, the Labour Party was considering whether the economy could be boosted in a way that even a marriage between the sixth in line to the throne and a beautiful American actor couldn't provide. Whilst Harry and Meghan exchanged vows, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell were committing themselves to transforming the British economy. At the Labour Party's annual State of the Economy conference, there were promises to shake up the accountancy industry and ease the economic pressures that are leading to a deterioration in mental health. I tore myself away from the nuptials to sit down with the Shadow Chancellor. You've promised an irreversible shift in the balance of wealth and power in favour of working people. How would you actually achieve that if you were in government? The basis of our economic policy, it, we'll plan our economy on the basis of yes, how we use monetary policy, how we use fiscal policy investment, but we want structural change as well. So what we're talking about is how do we extend ownership within our society? So development of the cooperative sector, doubling it. I'd like to go further. We know we'll match what's happening in France and Spain and Germany on that. How we give workers the right to own when a company is sold on, let them have the first bid. How do we ensure there's profit sharing in companies? That happens across Europe, doesn't seem to happen here on, on any scale. So in that way, you're investing in the economy, you're creating a prosperous economy, but you're making sure that prosperity is shared by everybody. So in that, and by building ownership into that economy, that then becomes irreversible because people will have a stake in their company and the economy overall. But how would that work for an existing privately owned business at the moment? You would force them to sell part of the business to the workers? Well, what would happen is, is we'd, for France's example, they legislate for profit sharing. We'd expect companies to profit share as well as ensure they have a decent wage policy as well. That's one way of doing it. Like John Lewis? Well, partly that, yes. A good, it's quite a good model. We could extend that. But also, you can see how instead of um, sharing profits by way of income, they can share profits by way of distribution of shares as well. So in that way, the the employees get a stake in the company and in that way I think they feel that they're making a contribution not just to themselves but to the wider benefit of other employees. So you're going around, you're having your cup of tea offensive <laughs> talking to big business because and to bankers. Because I won't accept a free meal off them. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, are you trying to tell them don't worry, we won't be that radical, you don't have to be frightened of a Labour government? No, what I'm saying to them is this, these are our plans. Some of them you will like, some of them you won't like, I accept that, but there's nothing up my sleeve, so get used to that, that's what's going to happen. And in that way, you can get investing in our country, investing in the projects that we want to bring forward, you'll get a fair rate of return, but we're not going to be ripped off anymore. Simple as that. So you're, trying, you're reassuring business that you're being transparent with them, that you're being open with the plans, yet you're also talking about transforming the way wealth and power is in society. You fought the last election on a not too radical manifesto so people might think well that was just the tip of the iceberg because actually you talk as though you have plans to totally transform the economy what was the manifesto as far as you're prepared to go or are you actually looking at much much bigger changes the manifesto was for the last election and we're consulting now on the next manifesto both in terms of not just our party but also more widely that's why i'm that's why I'm in the city. That's why I'm meeting workers at the same time as I'm meeting directors too, to say, look, this is our, how we want to achieve. You know our objectives. If, you're on, if the policies that you want us to Im implement, come and explain those policies to us and have a proper discussion. But what I'm saying to them is the last manifesto is the foundation upon which we'll go forward. One thing they'll know from us is certainty. There'll be no tricks up my sleeve. You will see, I'll say to them all, you will see what we're going to deliver. As I said, some you'll like, some you won't, but the one thing about it is that they all like, we're all on the same page when it comes to we want a prosperous economy. How do we achieve that? Well, we're on the same page about investment, structural change in the economy as well. We want to ensure that we have a new investment programme through a strategic investment board, a national investment bank, and also structural change within individual companies. We can't go on in terms of, well, we've seen it this week. We can't go on with the Carillions of this world. We can't go on with an accountancy profession, largely in big four com com firms that are the auditors and the accountants, and allow companies then to go bust, yet they always line their pockets. You spent your life, until very recently, on the political 
fringes. In fact, even when there was a Labour government, you were producing alternative budgets to what your own party's government was producing. When you were doing that, did you ever imagine you might be the real Shadow Chancellor, actually taking these meetings in the city, devising this policy? I used to chair the Socialist Campaign Group. Along with Jeremy Corbyn, one of the things we always said to the left, be ready for government tomorrow. Always be ready, because otherwise people won't take you seriously. We can win the battle of ideas, and eventually we may win the battle of organisation, and that's what we've done. What's interesting now is the ideas that we've been advocating are mainstream. We've won the argument in many respects. And if you look at even some of the policies that you know, the Daily Mail and the Times and others attacked us on, on public ownership, opinion poll after opinion poll saying, yes, bring water back into public ownership, because we, you know, it's intolerable the way we're ripped off at the moment. 80% support. Same with rail. In terms of the development of energy, alternative energy structures at the local level, looking at the German model. All of this is common sense socialism and that's what we're implementing, that's why it's popular. When you talk about the cooperative models of business, and you've talked also in the past about democratising the economy, if you ask British businesses to do that, do you not saddle them with management structures and costs that the likes of Amazon simply will never have to shoulder. You've got these huge global multinationals now who actually seem more powerful than government yeah. and beyond the reach of regulation. And what I've been saying in recent speeches is that we've got to recognise the world has changed globally as well. And we now have a limited number of global corporations that stir the world looking to maximise their profits irresponsibly in many instances. So in addition to what we do nationally, we've got to look for some global agreements as well, almost like a new Bretton Woods that doesn't just take into account individual sovereign countries, but actually takes into account the structures that we now have on these massive transnational corporations. And we've seen that already, the way in which, well, Google, Facebook and others, tax evasion, tax avoidance has got to be addressed. But also the, the control of data is now one of the key issues that we need, not just national agreements on, but international agreements on. And we want to be, well, the leading country in leading that debate. Now, you used to put in your who's who entry that your hobby was fomenting the overthrow yes. of capitalism. and everyone thinks I misspelt that. It wasn't. It was a joke on brewing, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> is it now your job, the overthrow of capitalism, Transform rather than your yes, hobby? Yes, it is. It's transforming our economy. Because I think we've got, at the moment... Oh, there's a difference between transforming the economy and overthrowing well, capitalism. I don't think it is. I, think, I don't think it is, because I think, at the end of the day, I want a socialist society. And that means transforming in a way which radically challenges the system as it now is and I think that's what we're doing and what's interesting we're taking people with us because people see that has, there has to be that transformation we cannot allow another crisis to occur that occurred in 2007 2000 where we all have to pay for that we can't allow well I you know I can get quite emotional about this look only a few months ago we had someone die a homeless person die within feet of a door of parliament I don't want to live in a society like that and I don't think the British people do either you've been on Great supporter of the economic experiment in Venezuela, and it's in the news because of the yeah. elections this week. That's now a country that's plagued by hyperinflation, chronic shortages of yeah. food, medicine, poverty. Well, I, you know this. That's an example of a failed socialist economic It went model. wrong. I no, I don't think it was a socialist country. I think what happened was Chavez were developing policies which I think would, first of all, tackle the tragedy of the poverty that was in that country, raising literacy rates and then investing in the economy, using their oil wealth to do that. I think it took a wrong turn when Chavez went, and I think, un unfortunately, since then, I don't think they've been follow following the socialist policies that Chavez was developing. And as a result of that, they're experiencing the current problems. What should they have done? I think they should have made sure, yes, they had a more equal society, that's exactly that. Yes, invested as Chavez was doing in education and skills, but then also invested in building up the infrastructure for the economy itself. And he was moving on to that, and I think it failed. And then you had levels of corruption as well, unfortunately. On the Sunday politics last week, uh, Baroness Chakrabarti came into the studio, and she said she thought Ken Livingston should be expelled from the Labour Party. He's currently suspended, but that he should be expelled. And then just yesterday, Martha Osmore was appointed as a Labour peer, and she signed an open public letter criticising the investigations into people accused of anti-Semitism, including Ken Livingston. Is that right, that she should be being appointed to the Lords to sit beside Chami I, dis I disagree with us. I disagree with Martha signing that letter. I, I wouldn't sign that letter, and I disagree with her doing it. 
But I don't want that to prevent her going to the House of Lords because uh, she's got a record of standing up on equalities issues, actually on campaigning on anti-Semitism as well, and a record of service to the party, but also actually a record of service to the community. We need that sort of commitment and talent in the House of Lords. So I'm welcoming her to the House of Lords. I think she'll, she'll play a great role. I'm sure you would almost be talking about anything else other than anti-Semitism yeah. right now, but it's her appointment yeah, that means it's back in the news I again. I know, but we move beyond that. I disagree with her signing that letter, but once she's in the House of Lords, you'll see just how effective she'll be in tackling inequality. I don't mind talking about anti-Semitism because we've got to root it out, and I don't just mean the Labour Party. I I'm, do not want to live in a society where I get reports that there are Jewish graves that are painted upon with swastikas, or where you have to have security guards in Jewish schools. That is not a society I will want to live in or I will tolerate. And that's why, as a party, we've got to get back to being the anti-racist party that we are, which I think we are as well. Now, we're talking now at lunchtime on Saturday about economics policy. The rest of the country is watching something else. Yeah. Lucy, can I have the iPad? Um, the Royal Wedding, as you can see, yeah. uh, in full flow yeah, um, here. Yeah. I'm very flattered you want to be talking to me instead of this, but does it mean you're, are you out of tune with the rest of the country when no, this is what no, they're interested no, in? No, we booked this. This is our annual State of the Economy conference. We booked this ages ago, and so all our preparations for this were well underway until this royal wedding was announced. I wish the young couple all the happiness, and uh, it looks as though it's going to be a fantastic day for them. You're promising a revolution in British society. When you look at the crowds lining the street, waving Union Jacks, street parties up and down the country, the nation is sold out of bunting. <laughs> it looks like quite a small-c Conservative country that's not ready for your kind of radical revolution. Well, I don't think that's true. I think constitutionally, it looks as though yeah, there is a clear majority who's in favour of a, a, a royal family rather than being Republican. I accept that. That's fine. And that's lovely for them as well. And this sort of pageantry, people really enjoy. So that's wonderful. However, Does it stir a patriotic note in your heart when no, you watch this I'm, kind of thing? I'm, no, because I'm a Republican. But, you know, I've met the Queen. I'm, part, I'm a Privy Councillor member. I have the deepest respect for her. I've had, she's visited my constituency and I showed her around. I've met Prince Charles at various con other events. You know, and I like them, you know. I, I couldn't have more respect for the role that she's played, let's put it that way. But I'm a Republican, that's it. I don't believe in a monarchy, but the, clearly the majority of people in this country do. I accept their wishes. However, and the whole world is watching this wedding. Is it good for Britain when the rest of the world sees this kind of thing happening? And this is the image that we send abroad. I think it's a, an image that people enjoy, let's put it that way. But you mentioned this, uh, are these people conservatives? Well, just because you support a monarchy, it doesn't mean you're a Conservative. It doesn't mean you're a Conservative with a small c. I bet if you go and ask most of those people, shall we bring rail back into public ownership, 70 or 80 percent of them will say, too right, you should. John McDonald, thanks, thanks very much for talking to us this afternoon. That was Labour's Shadow Chancellor speaking to me yesterday.